It would be impossible to estimate the influence exerted on revival movements all over the world during the past hundred years by Charles Finney's lectures on prayer in his Revivals of Religion, Arthur Wallace. Charles Finney was, by far, the greatest revivalist that America has ever seen. After Finney published his lectures on revival, revivals started breaking out all over the world. In the early days of the Salvation Army, which was really a street preaching movement started by William and Catherine Booth, they used Finney's lectures on revival as a type of official manual for their Salvation Army. One of Catherine's biographers said, Finney, she considered to be a sound champion of the truth. And Miss Booth studied his writings perhaps more than those of any other author and continued to do so and to recommend them to others to the end of her life. Catherine Booth said, I often wish I could have an hour's talk with Finney. She even sent her son, Bromwell Booth, who succeeded William Booth as general, a copy of Finney's lectures on systematic theology to study. The Historical Dictionary of the Salvation Army said, Catherine Booth referred to Finney's revival lectures as the most beautiful and common sense work on the subject that I have ever read. In the 1880s, when the Booths wanted to train Salvation Army cadets in revival methods, they used Finney's books. In Origins of the Salvation Army, we read, Charles Grandison Finney wrote lectures on revival, which greatly influenced Catherine and William Booth. Their approach to revivalism copied Finney's American methods. The Booths and hundreds of others committed to memory his manual for successful evangelism. George Scott Railton, Booth's mission secretary in the 1870s, placed Finney above Wesley and Whitfield as Booth's model for sermon making. Catherine often remarked on the parallels between the careers of Finney and her husband. The clergy rebuffed both for their preaching manner and unconventional educational backgrounds. Both refused to become ministerial trainees when that meant embracing Calvinist dogma. To Catherine, Finney was an American William Booth. Jonathan Goforth, the foremost missionary revivalist of the early 20th century, read Finney's lectures on revival and then started seeing revival in the mission field. Goforth said in his biography, Late in the fall of 1905, Eddie's little pamphlet containing selections from Finney's autobiography and revival lectures was sent to me by a friend in India. It was the final something which set me on fire. On the front page of this pamphlet, there is a statement to the effect that a farmer might just as well pray for a temporal harvest without fulfilling the laws of nature as for Christians to expect a great ingathering of souls by simply asking for it and without bothering to fulfill the laws governing the spiritual harvest. If Finney is right, I vowed, then I'm going to find out what those laws are and obey them, no matter what it costs. Early in 1906, while on my way to take part in the intensive evangelistic work which our mission conducted yearly at the great idolatrous fair at Hassan Hussein, a brother missionary loaned me the full autobiography of Finney. It is impossible for me to estimate all that that book meant to me. We missionaries read a portion of it daily while we carried out our work at the fair. Goforth wrote about the influence that Finney's revivals and lectures had upon his own ministry and how Finney even influenced Charles Spurgeon to start praying for revival in England. Finney depended more upon the prayers of Father Nash and Clary to bring down Holy Ghost revival than upon his own resistless logic. So accustomed are we today to the Laodicean condition of the church that the all-pervading influence of prayer in Finney's time amazes us. 
Imagine 40 ministers and missionaries being thrust into the Lord's harvest field as the result of prayer during one revival in a Rochester high school. By 1857, Finney was seeing 50,000 a week turning to God. In many cities, there is no building large enough to hold the prayer meetings. It was at that time that the Fulton Street prayer meeting started in a side room in a church and in a few weeks had taxed the capacity of the entire building to the utmost and had even overflowed to neighboring churches. In 1858, Mr. Spurgeon called his great congregation together and said, The Spirit of God is saving multitudes now in the United States. Since God is no respecter of persons, we will pray until he sends similar showers of blessing upon our land. Someone wrote to me and asked, well, how many of Finney's converts actually remained uh, in the faith or were found in church a year later? And he said it was practically none. He said the free will, uh, easy believism gospel uh, results in mostly false converts. I wrote back and said the majority of Charles Finney's converts remained in the faith until the end of their lives. And he did not preach a easy believism, false gospel. He called men to repent of their sins. And his converts were not false converts. They actually repented of their sins and committed their lives to Christ. And they turned from sin to righteousness, from self-centeredness to Christ-centeredness. Leonard Ravenhill said, Finney never made an altar call within the first 28 nights of preaching. Most of our evangelists don't have 28 sermons. 28 nights in a row and he never made an altar call. He didn't preach the love of God. He didn't say, you're a sinner, God loves you. He said, God is angry with the wicked every day, which the word of God says. He didn't preach grace, he preached law. He didn't preach love, he preached judgment. He didn't preach heaven, he preached hell. He didn't say, you're a wonderful person. He said, you're a rebel, but he got results. 64% of D.L. Moody's converts backslid. 72% of the converts Finney got stood because he knew how to attack the human will, not just the emotions. It's been well recorded that Finney had at least around 500,000 converts. And if 72% stayed in the faith, as Leonard Ravenhill said, then that is about 129,000 that fell away. Is that a lot of people? Sure it is, but that is 387,000 people that remained in the faith until the end of their lives. Even Jesus Christ had backsliders. It says in John 6:66, 6, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. The word many here means a large group of people or most people. It amazes me that Calvinists will attack Charles Finney as this uh, terrible, uh, heretical monster, and yet they defend a man like John Calvin. You see, I would take 72% of converts that remained in the faith over the track record of, uh, say, John Calvin, who, as far as we know, never led a single lost soul to the Lord. Not one testimony can be provided of John Calvin winning a sinner to Christ. But that's all that we see throughout the life and ministry of uh, Charles Finney. So it amazes me that Calvinists will attack Charles Finney because he did the altar call, and yet they praise John Calvin as a great hero of the faith. While Charles Finney was converting the enemies of God, John Calvin was burning them. Calvin wasn't saving souls, he was burning heretics. I would take a Charles Finney over a John Calvin any day. This was from someone who was around uh, after the revivals of Charles Finney. Charles G. Finney was born in Warren, Connecticut, August 29th, 1792. The 100 years which have passed since that date are doubtless the most remarkable 100 years of the world's history. The influence of Mr. Finney has been one of the potent factors in producing these remarkable years. More and more his name is receiving honorable mention as his work and power are better known and appreciated. 
there can be no question that it is to stand amongst the few greatest leaders of religious thought of the century. Memorial Address by Professor John Ellis, 1892. So it would do us much good if we, as the modern street preaching movement, would read Finney's lectures on revival and memoirs of revival, that these writings will continue to plant the seeds of revival all over the world. If you would like a copy of Finney's lectures on revival, his memoirs of revival, or his systematic theology, visit our website openairoutreach.com and click on the bookstore and we have uh, many different writings of Charles Finney available uh, for you to order.